Okay, hi everybody. Today we're going to be doing a quick introduction to the abnormal psychology chapter. So I often ask my students to think about uh, what is abnormal? What, what's abnormal to you, right? In the word abnormal, you find the word normal, right? So abnormal is anything that's not normal. But what is normal? What is abnormal? We have to be able to define this, especially since we want to conduct um, you know, tests, you want to understand, you want to predict behavior. So we need to understand what it is. So what is it to you? Think about this question. And usually ask my class to define it in their own ways, right? If you had 10 seconds to think about a definition, how would you define abnormal to any person on the street, right? Now, when it comes to a definition, we need a definition that fulfills certain criteria, right? Firstly, it should be objective. What does that mean? If it's something's objective, it means it remains that way, um, through time, right, through different conditions. We need something that we can refer to as an objective, definitive uh, answer as to what is abnormal. This will help us then understand um, a phenomenon or people's behavior better, right, if it's objective. If it's something that can constantly change its meaning, then it doesn't really have any meaning. Right? Secondly, it should be consistent, right? That means um, if I apply this definition um, across different circumstances, across different times, it should produce a consistent uh, meaning, right? That means it should be consistent. If something keeps changing its meaning from time to time, then it doesn't, it, it's not something that I can easily use as a definition, right? Because I wouldn't know, does it mean this, this time? Does it mean something else the next time? So our definition of abnormal should be consistent. It should also be accurate, right? There are a lot of different human behaviors that are in the world. We need to make sure our definitions are accurate so that we don't misdiagnose someone. So there are four criteria that we can use to um, talk about in terms of abnormality, right? What constitutes abnormal behavior? Uh, part of this is actually screenshotted from a, another YouTube video, um, but that YouTuber has, has removed his video on abnormality and I'm uploading mine, which is a mixture of some of the knowledge that I've gained and also some of the stuff that I've seen from others, right? So we talk about statistical infrequency. What does that mean? Statistics is, you know, the measurement of things. And so, you know, when you measure people's behavior in a population of human beings, right, you want to know what happens the most, right? And what happens the most is usually the average score, right? Infrequency is the opposite of the word frequent. So frequent is something that happens a lot. Infrequency is something that doesn't happen very often, right? Behavior that is uh, rare, you might say. Another thing that we can look at is the deviation from social norms. So what does that mean? Social norms refer to any behavior that is considered normal by society standard. If you have something that's deviating from this, it means something that is not usually seen in society, right? Everybody um, walks forward and you see someone walking backwards, that's a deviation from a social norm. Right? Or abnormality can also be a failure to function adequately. What does that mean? That means that, you know, in your daily life, you are unable to do the things that people should normally do, like, you know, brush your teeth, eat three meals a day. Um, get up early in the morning, right, to do your things, you know, that you need to do in the day. Work, you know, hold a job. Some people have difficulties holding a normal job, right? So when they fail to function adequately, that might be something to do with abnormal behavior. Lastly, a deviation from adequate mental health, right? So people in their minds, they have to have, you know, a, a feeling that everything's going to be okay, the world's all right, they can function in it and all that. And when you have a strong deviation against that and people start thinking that, oh my gosh, the world's going to end tomorrow, I'm a terrible person all the time, 24-7, right? That's a deviation from adequate mental health. So let's look at this in detail. Statistical infrequency is basically this, identifying what is common versus what is rare. So let me ask you this question, right? What is the average IQ of human beings? Anybody? Can you think about it? What is it? The average IQ of a human being is considered to be 100, right? That's the average IQ. But what's the average IQ range, right? So 100 is the average IQ, so most people would be around the 100 range, but not everybody's going to be at exactly 100, right? Some people 101, maybe 99. Does that mean they're abnormal? No, we also have to consider a certain range of IQ scores, right? Do you know what the IQ range is? Let me show you on this graph. So if you look at this graph, this is the graph, this is the IQ score distribution, right? You can see that 100 right in the middle, right? So 100 is the average score, right? Most people will be around there. But not just 100, it'll also have a certain um, range, right? And the range, sorry, the, oops, excuse me, 
before. Right? So the range is actually between 85 to 115, if you can see that, right? From 85 to 115, that's the average range for most human beings on Earth. Around 68% of the human population is there. You can see the number 68% covering the blue area. What about the orange area? You can see you add 14% on one side and 14% on the other side. That range is between 70 to 130, right? So that covers 95% of the human population. But what you find is that at the two extremes, right, on the bottom extreme, 0.1%, 2% of the population and so on. So that is, okay, it's approximately 2.5% of the population if you split it on both sides, right? Because 100 minus 95 is 5%. 5% divided by 2 ends would be about 2.5% approximately of people who have below 70 IQ. Now, if you're below 70 IQ, you're going to find it quite challenging to do the things that most of us in society can do, right? To function adequately. You need to have a certain level of IQ to be able to hold a job, right? To be able to read and understand messages, right? And, and the more complex things become, the higher your IQ should be. If your IQ is really low, it's quite difficult, right? Now, I don't want to call these people stupid, right? We usually use that term to put people down, right? But these people do have low IQs and they do exist, right? At the other end of the spectrum, you have people who are geniuses, right? People with extremely high IQs. Now, on one end, I mean, of course, this refers to people like Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton, the geniuses of the human age, right? And a very small percentage of people are there. Now, on both ends, it's statistically infrequent, meaning that this does not happen very often. Very few people in society are like this, but they're, they're still there, right? Now, when we think about the word abnormal, here's where the difficulty might be. Most people think that the word abnormal is something that's negative. So people who are not so smart, they're abnormal. But that's not true. Albert Einstein was also abnormal because he was abnormally more intelligent than others, right? Whereas other people might be abnormally less intelligent than others, right? It's abnormal simply from a numbers perspective. It has nothing to do with value. It has nothing to do with being positive or negative or whatever. It's just simply from a numerical point of view. In terms of numbers, statistical infrequency refers to abnormality, right? Because it's not common in society. What's common is people between 85 to 100. That's the most common, right? Uh, anything outside of that is less and less common. It's more rare. And because it's rare, it can be considered abnormal, right? What about this? What, is, what does it look like that's going on here? So statistical infrequency was the first one. A deviation from social norms is the second one, right? What does that mean? Everybody else is there lining up, dressed as people normally are. But this one woman, she's wearing a sackcloth and she's jumping around like that instead of walking like a normal person. Of course, nobody's staring at her. Maybe this was planned as a shot. Uh, but the people at the back there seem to be pointing towards her or looking at her funnily, right? So this is a deviation from social norms. It's normal for people to walk upright in society. It's not normal for someone to be jumping around in a brown color cloth bag, right? That's not normal. And so that might be considered abnormal behavior, right? Maybe she's imagining something. Maybe there's something wrong with her. Or maybe she's just having a laugh and she just wants to prank people, right? It could be one of those as well. So what are the social norms? Walking normally, it's a deviation if you do something that's different, right? So this is a violation of unwritten rules in society, right? Nobody writes down in a rule book, you must walk normally and upright in society, right? That's not a written rule, right? But it's accepted that that's the way we behave, right? When you get into a public transport, for example, a train or a bus, usually the unwritten rule is you should remain quiet, right? Don't make too much noise because it's a public area. Right? If you're in a private room on your own car, you can sing as loudly as you want, you can make as much noise as you want, right? But if you're in a public space, you should not make too much noise, right? It's unwritten rule in society, particularly Asian societies, right? So if you violate these rules, you are considered doing something that's abnormal. And in some cases, even criminal, right? It's normal to treat people politely and with respect. If you start stabbing people, that's abnormal behavior. And, and that's actually more than abnormal, it's criminal behavior, right? Because you are breaking the law. If you're jumping around in a sackcloth, that's not really breaking the law, right? If you happen to be listening to music loudly on the public transport, that's not really criminal, it's not really breaking the law per se, but it is abnormal, right? What about this picture? What does this picture remind you of? It looks like this person is working and then she's completely burnt out, right? She's really, you know, exhausted. She can't function adequately, right? So a failure to function adequately is a, fun is a characteristic of abnormal abnormality, right? It's when you cannot cope with day-to-day -day living, right? Simple things like, you know, brushing your teeth, eating a meal, being able to hold a job, right? Uh, Rosenham and Seligman in 1989, they classified certain characteristics of what 
um, comes under this, right? They said when people feel a sense of suffering, uh, maladaptiveness means they, they become a danger to themselves, right? If you don't eat every day, you will starve and you will end up dying, right? You will destroy your health. Um, so that's maladaptive. You're unable to function adequately. You can't do the things that you need to do for your body. Or you might be vivid and unconventional, right? You might start, you know, um, forcing yourself to only wear the color pink when you go out, right? That's very, very unconventional and it's an inability to function adequately, right? You can't be turning up at someone's funeral dressed full in pink, wearing a pink flamingo on your head. That wouldn't make any sense. That would be quite abnormal to see, right? Or you can become very unpredictable. So unpredictability, irrationality, you're not thinking logically, you're very illogical, you, you do things weirdly and unpredictably. Um, you also cause observers to feel a sense of discomfort. So when people are around you, they feel very uncomfortable. You make people feel uncomfortable. You're very awkward. Now, of course, this might just be normal sense of awkwardness. Sometimes people tell, you know, for example, you're telling a joke and it doesn't work and people don't laugh and you might feel uncomfortable. That, that's, that's, that's fairly acceptable behavior, right? But this is like more extreme, right? You really make people feel uncomfortable. They don't want to be around you. They want to get away from you as much as possible, right? You know, so um, things like this, then you know you're failing to function adequately. Or you violate moral and social standards, right? You do things which are weird, like the woman who's jumping around in a sack. That's very strange, right? Or a moral standard, for example, treating people with respect. Instead of treating people with respect, you, you just go around shouting and screaming at people. That's a violation of a moral standard, right? So all these things, you know, um, show that a person has difficulty coping with day-to-day -day living, right? Now look at this picture. This picture, wow, this boy is smiling, he's happy, he's running through the water. Um, it's beautiful colors of gold and yellow. And I show this picture to show like, you know, what, what, what does a adequately mental, positive health, excuse me, let me rephrase that. What is a, what is a positive, uh, fully, how would I phrase this? It's, it's so often we focus on the abnormal, we forget how to phrase the normal, right? What would a normal person look like? A normal, positive, full of self-esteem, you know, uh, 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 individual look like? I mean, this is a picture that I found on Unsplash and I thought this really encapsulates everything. The feeling, the colours of this picture encapsulate what, what a positive, happy life looks like. and something that I think we should all strive to do, right? And um, that would be ideal mental health, right? That's the word I was looking for. Ideal mental health would be happy, positive, you know, full of self-esteem. Um, but anything that deviates from that might be considered abnormal, right? So firstly, you have to establish, establish what is normal mental health. What, what does a normal person look and function and, and think like, right? So firstly, they should have a positive view of themselves, right? You should think positively of yourself. If you think negatively of yourself, you're deviating from ideal mental health, right? You should have some level of growth and development. That's normal for human beings, right? We don't stay children for our whole lives. We grow and develop as adults. Right? You have a sense of autonomy, right? Um, you're independent, right? When you're children, you, when you're a child, you depend on your parents to take care of you. When you grow up into a teenager, you test your autonomy. You grow up into an adult, you take care of yourself. You can't keep depending on your parents forever. One day, they're not going to be around. Are you able to take care of yourself, right? Uh, you also have an accurate perception of reality, right? I'll give you an example. Let's say, um, let's say uh, you plan to go out for um, an outing. Maybe you want to go hiking somewhere, and then it rains. And then you blame yourself and say, I'm such a failure. Everything I do is, is a failure. I can't even plan hiking, you know, properly without it raining. But you're not the cause of the rain, right? You don't control the weather. The weather is, is sort of, I mean, God's in control, you know. And, you know, um, and it's outside of your, your, your control. You can't control the weather. So you can't blame yourself and call, call yourself a failure just because it rains, right? That would be an inaccurate perception of reality, right? People who are um, stuck in a cycle of depression often think of themselves in that manner, very negative manner. They, they fail to accurately perceive reality as being sometimes out of their control, and that's okay, right? It rains today, it's fine, let's go tomorrow, you know? So being accurate in your perception of reality is good for ideal mental health. Also having positive relationships with people, right? With your parents, with your friends, um, with people around you, with your extended family, right? Uh, with yourself, in fact, right? It's not only being positive to yourself, it's being positive with others as well, right? So having positive relationships is important. Right? and environmental mastery. So environmental mastery refers to the ability to, um, to, to, to navigate your life through the environment that you're in. 
right? If you're in a particular family, in a particular place in the world, in a particular social economic status, can you make the most of it? Can you survive? Can you live in that environment? Can you learn to live in the difficulties in that environment, right? So being able to master your environment or any environment that you encounter, right? If I take you from this place and I put you somewhere else, you know, if you're traveling as a tourist in one country and you have a certain way of acting in that country, but let's say you go to another country and they act differently, right? So I'm from Malaysia, for example. I'm from an Asian country where we like to keep to ourselves. We don't really, we're not very loud people. But when I went to America, I noticed that people are often very um, confrontational, not in a bad way, but they like to share their opinions openly. They like to, 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 to sh just be with people and, you know, be more extroverted. And so I had to get used to that, right? And I had to be able to master my environment in a different place. I had to stand up for myself, share about what's on my mind and not just keep it to myself, which is what I usually do in Malaysia. Um, you can actually go online and do a quick mental health problem solver. So uh, this is New ha Harbinger, Harbinger, I believe I'm pronouncing that right. New Harbinger's mental health problem solver. So they'll ask you some questions and you can identify, um, you know, perhaps what characteristics um, of mental health issues you might be exhibiting. Now, a quick disclaimer, just because you do this does not mean you have any severe abnormal mental health issues, right? This is just a very simple diagnostic tool to show you that perhaps you have some certain characteristics that might be um, leaning towards a particular mental health condition or another, right? This does not mean you need to immediately go for help, right? But if you are, you know, fulfilling certain things like, you know, you fail to function adequately, if you feel like, you know, life is meaningless, then please do definitely go and consult a licensed um, psychologist and therapist to get the help that you need. These online tests should just be used as, um, you know, if you're curious, you just want to understand um, certain characteristics about yourself, feel free to do these tests. Um, they should not be used as diagnostic tools, right? You need a licensed professional to give you a professional opinion. Okay, um, that's all for the introduction to abnormality. Um, stay tuned for more information on my video channel.